Hi everyone. Now we're going to move on to nonverbal communication. And nonverbal communication uh, is another one of those areas which is really fascinating uh, to study and to look at. Uh, because just like communication and language, it's such an important part of how we communicate, and yet we spend very little time actually examining uh, our nonverbal communication. And nonverbal communication really is a skill. You can use it to become a more effective uh, communicator. So we're going to look at that today. Let's start by looking at something fun, though. I saw this, uh, and I thought it was really nice, really cute. Bobby has four dimes. Amy has 30 pennies. Which child has more money? Bobby. How do you know? Show your thinking. Well, Bobby. It takes me back to my childhood in elementary and middle school when the teacher always asked, show your work, especially on math problems, right? Show your work. And sometimes you just knew the answer. You could calculate it in your head, and the hardest part was actually showing your work. So I saw that, and I like that. A quick overview of what today's lecture is going to examine. We're going to look at nonverbal communication. What is it? We're going to look specifically at some um, some facets of nonverbal communication, like your clothes. What does your clothes say about you? Eye contact and the use of space. And we're going to make a connection to speech anxiety uh, as we conclude this. So nonverbal communication is the behavior and elements of speech, aside from the words themselves that transmit meaning. So in other words, it's everything else other than the actual spoken word. So it's things like pitch, speed, the tone of your voice, the volume, how loud you talk, or how softly you talk. It's about the hand gestures that you may make or your body gestures, the facial expressions you make with your face, the way that you hold your body in terms of posture and stance, proximity or the use of space, which we'll talk about here in a bit, eye contact, dress, and appearance. Now this is important because research suggests that only 5% effect is produced by the spoken word. So the meaning of a message um, is oftentimes very little of that actually has anything to do with a word that we actually speak. Almost half of it is the tone and inflection that we use and other elements of our voice. And 50% of that uh, remainder is dictated by our body language, the movements, and our eye contact. Right? There's this saying about nonverbal communication and that it's important to, to study because nonverbals can leak our true feelings. Right? Here's a good example of nonverbals leaking true feelings. Let's take a look at this very happy monkey who is seeing a magic trick for the very first time. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very happy monkey. His nonverbal uh, expressions tell us exactly how that monkey feels. Before we move on to what your clothes say, I want to do say that nonverbals leak our true feelings. Um, we can see another example of this. Imagine, think about a time where maybe a friend or maybe it was someone you were in a romantic relationship with. Um, and think about a time when they were clearly upset. You could tell from their nonverbal communication, you could tell from their body language, you could tell from the way they were acting towards you that something was wrong. And they said, you, you ask, what's wrong? Tell me what's wrong, what's going on? And they say, nothing, nothing, I'm fine, right? You're, you examine the nonverbals of that person, it's very clear to see that they're lying, right? That their nonverbals are leaking their true feelings, right? Maybe they start to cry. Well, clearly they're not fine, right? So that's what we mean by nonverbals can leak our true feelings. If you're upset, it's very hard um, for you to hide that. Our facial expression and our nonverbals often give it away. So our nonverbals can leak our true feelings. When we look at what our clothes say, our clothes are probably one of the, the top nonverbal uh, ways that we communicate, or one of the top ways we communicate nonverbally. So uh, we look at it and just simply say, what do, what do your clothes say? What do your clothes say about you? Well, research is clear. Speaker appearance has a direct impact on an audience perception of credibility. So this is important if you're going on a job interview, maybe you're giving a presentation in class, 
giving a presentation at a conference or you're networking, right? So speaker appearance has a direct impact on an audience's perception of our credibility. So that's where the old cliche saying dress, dress for success or dress for the part comes into play. Because if you are dressed professionally, people perceive you to be more credible. Uh, our class is online, but imagine uh, the classes that maybe you've had in the past that were face-to-face -face in a typical classroom, right? If the instructor came in on the first day in sweatpants and a tank top and a backwards ball cap, you might not perceive he or she to be a credible professor in relation to the subject matter, right? So uh, same thing with a job interview. If you show up in sweatpants and a tank top and a t-shirt to a job interview, you're probably not going to get the job uh, unless maybe you're interviewing for a lifeguarding position in the summer or something, right? So your clothes say very specific things about you. Here's a nice example of that, right? So you can tell from the clothes and the body language, the guy here on the far left who's defensive and nervous, we think the guy right beside him, he's hiding something, right? He has a menacing look. Uh, in terms of facial expression, his hands are in his pockets, right? The guy in the middle, same guy, right? But now all of a sudden we view him to be confident and genuine, confident and genuine uh, in relation to the other people around him. So you can see here from this one slide the difference in uh, that clothes make. We judge people, whether it's fair or not, we judge people all the time knowing nothing about them as people, only knowing uh, how they're dressed, and our perception of their credibility based off of that. So clothes are important. Here are a few of my students. There's a very interesting uh, power, or a very interesting TED Talk called uh, by Amy Cuddy called Power Posing and how it affects uh, your, uh, your body, how your nonverbals can actually impact your speaking. Uh, we look a little bit we can look at nonverbals in terms of clothing even in more detail. There's a lot of research that's been done around this. And we look at we can look at things like what the color of your clothes actually see about you. So there's an interesting research study that was done in 2016 that said what the, that was titled what the color of your tie says about you. And in that it, dim, it was this idea that those who wear red are perceived to be more uh, intimidating or more aggressive, whereas those who wear blue are considered to be more passive. We see the psychology of color in other avenues as well. Uh, people in terms of color, you'll often see dining rooms painted red because the color red stimulates appetite. Uh, it has been proven that the color red tends to increase our blood pressure. It can make us feel anxious um, or give or make us feel like we have more energy uh, that's also why you you will rarely see a bedroom painted red because it's a place of relaxation think about it what color do you often see in bedrooms blues and pastels soft colors because blue tends to calm the mind right so there's a very interesting psychology behind color and you can research that and look at that in more detail if it's something that interests you but probably the number one thing that we can look at in terms of nonverbal communication that's going to have an impact in your life on a day-to-day -day basis is eye contact. I like this quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson who says, An eye can threaten like a loaded gun, or insult like a hissing or kick and kicking, or in its altered mood by beams of kindness make the heart dance with joy. There is no more powerful nonverbal communication uh, technique that we have than eye contact. Eye contact is important because it's the strongest form of nonverbal communication because we use it all the time. And if, if used correctly, we can use eye contact to build trust, to increase immediacy with people around us. There are also cultural implications with eye contact um, that, that are cultural based. So for instance, in the Western world, in the United States, um, and most of Europe, eye contact is considered not only polite, but uh, appropriate and necessary when having a conversation with someone. Uh, if you don't make eye contact when you're talking to someone, if you're looking away or you're looking down, people are going to perceive you to be not interested in the conversation and they're going to uh, 
um, perceive that to be very rude and disrespectful. However, in some Middle Eastern countries, it would be inappropriate to make eye contact, right? Uh, you would look away. You wouldn't make eye contact with someone in the eye because it's very rude and impolite. I remember when I was a senior in high school, I went on a uh, international trip for three weeks with about t there were about ten of us. I was the only guy on the trip. The rest of them were girls. And I remember we were in Morocco, Africa, and we went to get off of the tour bus. And the tour guide, who had been traveling with us for two weeks, looked at all the, the girls that were traveling with me and said, now, whatever you do, don't make eye contact with the men. And we're like, why? What do you mean? You can't look at the men. You can't make eye contact. And they said, in this culture, if you make eye contact with the men, it can be perceived as you are interested in them or you want to be their wife. Right? Think about that. Think about that difference in cultural cultural implications there. Right? That a woman cannot look a man in the eyes because it's viewed that you are interested in them and therefore you might want to be his wife. Right? That would be a tough call as as the a faculty advisor to call back home and say, I'm sorry, your daughter's not coming home uh, because she got married. She got married? What do you mean? Well, she looked someone in the eyes. So there are cultural implications which are really interesting as well to look into. We're going to talk about some best practices also of eye contact in terms of how you should do that. Uh, there's a photo of a doctor here because I have um, a doctor who has really good uh, eye contact. She makes great eye contact. So in the medical profession, we call that bedside manner. And I asked her once, I said, can you tell me, how, how did you develop this great bedside manner? How are you so good with connecting to your patients? Because she would come into the room and she would pull a chair up right beside me and she would literally sit a foot from me and she would look me in the eyes and she would say, Rick, how are you doing? And I just always found that to be very genuine and very caring. And she says, I learned a long time ago that eye contact is the most powerful tool that I have in terms of helping diagnose a patient because I can go in and I can have a conversation with you and I can look you in the eyes and I can ask, how are you doing? And your response, the nonverbals on your face, the tone, the way that you say the response, I can get a sense, a true sense of of how you feel so I can get an understanding of you know okay you just have a cold or you're here for a checkup or something is really bothering you and you're really concerned about something and she would change her diagnosis not her diagnosis but the, the ways that she would diag attempt to diagnose a problem based off of that nonverbal feedback she calls it a gut feeling right a sixth sense she she might hear or see the fear or the hesitation in in my nonverbals and my voice and she might say you know what let me go ahead and order these additional tests and let's look at this because i can really tell this is hurting uh, this is really bothering the patient so there's professions like that where having great nonverbal communication skills both uh, giving not good nonverbals and being able to interpret nonverbals can be especially impactful. We look at the usage of space. This is called proxemics in nonverbal communication, and it plays an important part because it looks at both how objects can be arranged in a space, um, how an object size, type, or expense of an object, how that all sends messages. And it is often a very overlooked part of nonverbal communication that, once again, has social and cultural implications. And there's some best practices that we can use in regards to the use of space. Uh, for instance, here I see there's an activity. Uh, part of the slide there is cut off, but th do this the next time that you're out. Uh, next time you're in an elevator, observe how people react, how people respond in terms of their use of space. When you go into an elevator, uh, people go to the corners, right? If a fifth person comes in, if there's someone at the corner, that person stands in the middle. People will spread out in an elevator to maximize probably an equal distance uh, within themselves. When we violate that space, it can create problems, which we'll look at. So there are zones of space that in the Western civilization, the United States and other European countries, that we tend to um, 
to hold uh, true to these uh, these nonverbal spaces. So public space is going to be 12 to 25 feet, and that's the the amount of space that we're comfortable having uh, between us and and strangers uh, in public uh, that we may not know. So if someone is within 12 feet of us. Uh, in public, we will likely not think anything about it. It will not make us uncomfortable. Social space is 4 feet to 12 feet. Social space is generally reserved um, if you are in a social setting. So you may not know the people that you're with, but you're in a social space. You're in a social setting. So as a result of that, if someone is closer than 12 feet to you, you're not going to feel like they're violating your, your personal zone. Uh, you're not going to feel uncomfortable. So think about this in the sense of you're at a restaurant. Uh, maybe you're out somewhere. You're, uh, you're at a party or social event. Uh, you don't know someone, but you're, you're okay with them being closer to you because of where you are in that social space. Personal space is 18 inches to 4 feet, and we reserve that for people that we know. So friends, um, family, uh, romantic interests, right? Though We let those people closer to us, and we're okay maybe with that person leaning up against us if, uh, if you see them somewhere, or maybe them giving you a hug. Uh, the person being that close to you is not going to make you uncomfortable. The closest space uh, in terms of zones is going to be the intimate space, and that's going to be 6 inches from your body up to 18 inches. And we most often reserve that zone of space for people um, that we're close to in romantic relationships, our family, right? These are people that we don't care that they are in our space, that their feet are across our, uh, our lap when we're laying on the couch, or maybe they're uh, they're leaned up or cuddled up against you, right? We allow them into that intimate zone of space that we reserve for people that we're close to. So another way of thinking about this, the intimate is going to be two fists. If you take a fist and you put another fist on top of it and put it against your chest, that's the distance that we are comfortable with in terms of intimate space. Personal is going to be about a handshake away, and social is going to be about two arm lengths away. So just another way of thinking about the use of space uh, in relation to distance. Now there are, as I mentioned, there are times that we break these norms. For instance, if you're in time um, or if you're in Grand Central Station here, you're going to be okay with people uh, being close to you. Maybe you're in Times Square, right? So the expectation is that you're not going to be able to have that 12 to 25 feet of space, and we're okay with that. It may still make us uncomfortable, but we let our guard down, uh, and we're okay with people being around us. We look at this guy sitting on the park bench. There's no one anywhere near him. He's probably pretty comfortable in that setting. If someone else came up to him and sit down on any of the other park benches, he'd probably be okay uh, unless they sit down to the park bench beside him and then he may be like, what's going on here? Or maybe they walk up, they, they pass all of those empty park benches and they sit right beside him on the end of the park bench. Now they have violated his sense of space. Like this guy in an airport. Maybe they know each other, maybe they don't. That sure is a lot of empty chairs for them to be sitting that close to each other. So they're likely probably going to, one of them is going to be uncomfortable in that scenario. This guy, I guess he was doing a social experiment. He was wearing some kind of hula hoop contraction that he made to essentially keep people out of his personal space. You can look at the nonverbals of the people passing him on the street and see exactly what they think uh, and how they feel about uh, about this contraction that he's wearing, right? They're like, what is going on? We value our personal space. Uh, as I said, uh, you want to violate someone's, uh, or want to see a violation of norms, cultural norms in relation to space, just get into an elevator where there's only you and another person and stand right beside them. It will make them uncomfortable. They will look at you like, what is going on? Because elevators are spaces like that where we... Uh, tend to hold true to those norms about space. So I'll talk about there's some implications with this in terms of it being overlooked and we can actually use it to our advantage. If you want more interaction out of people, so maybe you're giving a presentation or maybe you're holding a meeting at work um, or maybe a, a, a meeting with a club or an organization at school, if you want people to interact, if you want people to feel like their voice and their opinion matters, put them in a circle, right? 
put them in a circle because everyone will feel equal, they will feel like they have a voice, and therefore they will interact more. If you want less interaction, put them in the typical classroom seating where you are in front of them and they're in rows that says, hey, I have the power, I have the attention, you listen, I'm going to lead the conversation, but as a result of that, you're by the very nature of how that is set up and structured, you're going to have less interaction. Cooperative seating, right? You see here you can sit corner to corner or side to side. This is a really good approach if you ever find yourself in a management position. If you want people to feel like you actually care about what they have to say um, as an employee of yours um, or as a colleague or as a friend, sit beside them. Ask them to sit. Right? If a student were to come to my office hours, if we were in a physical classroom setting, I always ask them, say, here, have a seat, and, and I will then move my seat to the end of the desk right? so I can um, have a better conversation with them. And it, and it says, hey, we're, we're equal. We're equal. I, I, your input is valuable. Um, I'm willing to listen to what you have to say. You can also do that side by side. I will say sitting side by side can be a little bit awkward. I hate it when people sit side by side at dinner. If you're out at a restaurant and you look across and some and a couple is sitting side by side, it just seems a little awkward to me, right? So I don't think <laughs> I don't think out to dinner is the best place to sit side by side. But you can encourage cooperative seating and participation and discussion. Uh, in most other settings side by side. If you want true competitive, less interaction, sit face to face across from each other that says one of us has the power and one of us doesn't. There's some also some other interesting things about space. We call this territoriality and that's the sense of personal ownership that we have attached to particular space. Uh, easy example for this is think about a time that you walked into a classroom or that you had a class. We tend to sit in the same spots. Students do it all the time. They come in early in the semester, they find a seat, they like that seat, and they sit there every class. That makes it easy for the instructor because it helps us learn names. It also helps us to look out and be able to, to tell if someone is in class or if they're not. What happens so if you walk into class one day and someone else is in your seat? Right? You slow down, you walk by them, maybe you turn your head, you look back at them, maybe you make an audible noise. Right? You do something that says, hey, you're in my seat. Even though that's not technically your seat, but you have claimed it. That's territoriality, right? the sense of personal ownership that we attach to personal space. So what do you do the next class? You come early, right? You show up ahead of time. You make sure that you get there and that you get your seat back, right? So members who fail to respect the territory of others, they violate an important group norm. And we see that uh, with those types of examples. This is my younger brother who's now seven years old. When I was home at Christmas in Tennessee, I found this, saw this interesting sign on his door, girls are not allowed in my room. He's very territorial about his use of space at the age that he's in. But we do become territorial in regards to our space. A final takeaway, you can use space to your benefit. Um, if you, if you uh, create cooperative seating or you use space, especially in public speaking situations, it can increase immediacy, meaning, immediacy meaning how close other people feel to you. So other people will feel closer to you if you use space effectively. It can help build trust. Uh, with an audience and it can also reduce speech anxiety. So if you're giving speeches, you're going to do one partial online speech for this class. Uh, or maybe uh, when we get to that assignment, we'll look at it in more detail, but maybe you have speaking presentations and arrangements in other classes, right? The use of space can play to your benefit in terms of reducing speech anxiety. So my top nonverbal tip that I would have for you is to smile. Right? It's the easiest thing that you can do is smile. I'll give you an example here of why smiling is important. A few years back, I auditioned for Will of Fortune, and I was, I've always been really good with words. As a child, I would eat dinner with my parents, and then I would sit on the couch, and I would watch Will of Fortune with my mom. I became really good at, at puzzle solving in regards to words. So when I was in graduate school, Will of Fortune auditions came to town. And I auditioned, and I made the first cut, which was about 500 people. 
I made it through the second round of auditions, which took it down to like 200. I made it through the third, the fourth, and the fifth round of auditions, which left 10 of us. Will of Fortune was going to fly me out to Los Angeles to be on the show. I had already in my head decided how I was going to spend all of the money. I was going to pay off some student loans and I was going to buy a Tesla Model S. Right? I knew I was going to be so great because I was such a good solver uh, of puzzles in regards to the Wheel of Fortune that I knew I was going to be fantastic. So I'll get there and I'm able to solve puzzles easily. Like two word puzzles with one letter would pop up and I could solve the puzzle. Producer says, Rick, I hate to tell you, but we're not going to put you on the show. I was devastated. Why? Why? What do you mean you're not going to put me on the show? I'm great at solving puzzles. So my first thought was, they don't want me to win all of this money, right? And the producer says, we're not going to put you on the show because, yes, you are a fantastic puzzle solver, but you get so wrapped up in solving the puzzle, so focused on the puzzle that you forget to smile. And people who don't smile don't make for good television. If you want people to respect you in terms of when you're speaking, if you want people to be interested in you and find you engaging, you can do something as simple as just smiling. So I'll now write it on the bottom of all of my note cards if I'm giving a presentation or speaking in front of groups of people. I'll write a simple smiley face on my note card to remind me that I may be knowledgeable about the topic. I may be able to be engaging with the material, but if I don't smile, people aren't going to want to listen and they're not going to connect with me. So that's my top nonverbal tip. If you don't listen or get any other positive benefits from this lecture or from the reading on chapter four, take this one takeaway and I'll be happy. Smile is the biggest nonverbal way that we can communicate in a positive way, right? Even at strangers, smile at, at random strangers. You never know uh, what people are carrying, the burdens that they have in their own life, and sometimes we can make people feel better by simply just smiling at people. So try it. Put it into practice, and remember to smile.